Hello, everyone. All right. I'm gonna let a few more people come in. How's everybody doing this evening? <laughs> Marvelous, and you? Awesome, awesome. Excited about these cold crops. Got to get everything in the ground. <laughs> so while we wait a few more seconds just take a look at the slides on your screen if you don't know about keep growing detroit there's some valuable information for you all right so welcome everybody i am Nadja. I am the education coordinator at Keep Growing Detroit. Tonight's class is about uh, caring for cold crops. Our educator is Akello. Hello, Akello. <laughs> it's very knowledgeable, very helpful. So get prepared. Um, he will take you through a series of different topics about the cold crops. Uh, there will be a few breaks in between. We will do a question and answer section. And we'll go from there. Now, you know that uh, these classes are free, but we do greatly appreciate any donations. So if you feel compelled, you can scan the QR code here on your screen or reach out to us at a later date. All right, Akello, you ready? Yes, I am. <laughs> All right, let's see. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. I'll be going over our cold crops. And Naja, can you have the um, screen onto my camera with me? Say that again, hello. Oh, can you have the screen lock onto my face camera? Your face camera, okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at some point, I'll request uh, to share the screen. Okay. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. All right. So who here has picked up their cold crop transplants? Maybe a couple I people did. got some hand raises. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Well, all right. So. Right now we're in full swing of our co-crop distribution, giving away plants like our collards, kales, brassicas, and so on, along with some seeds with that. And so we'll just be going through pretty much the maintenance and care of those plants. And how I like to teach it is by taking people from the seed or transplant all the way through the steps and preparations you need to take to get your plant ready for harvest. And like Lanza share, we're going to make this a bit more uh, conversational and such. And so in this first section, I'll be going for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have some Q&A. And Naja, briefly, I'd like to do some screen share. Uh, here we go. All right. So please forgive all the technical difficulties. <clears throat> all right. So right now we're receiving a lot of our co-crop transplants and such. And right now our seeds are definitely okay to be planted right now. But before we get into planting with our transplants, we wanna make sure that we harden those off just giving them a little bit more time to get acclimated to the outside weather before we really start to plant our plants outside. But 
Let's uh, back up a little bit and talk about what a cold crop is. A cold crop is basically a turn given to plants that do well in our shoulder season. And so things like your collards, brassicas, and kales, they really like to and prefer to grow in during kind of April, March, and May, and even a bit of a June as well. Don't really do too well during the hot seasons, July and August. It's a bit harder of a period for them. And then they really do prefer those outside seasons, September, October, and they can even go on to November and through the <clears throat> through over the winter if you protect them accordingly. And so just a bit about Michigan's growing season. Our season, our last frost is experienced usually between May 1st, May 31st, uh, with this year. Uh, I don't know, it feels like our growing season might be a little bit extended. And then we experience our last, or excuse me, our first frost of the year between October 1st and October 31st. So keep that in mind if you're doing a lot of outside growing without any heat or any type of uh, protection, um, like remay or such for your plants. And how KGD does it to kind of help account for a couple things for our growers, we distribute our plants during the time frames of when they should be planted. So we're giving out our co crops during April, when that's usually a safe time to give out plants. And then we're giving our, our hot crops in May. And then we're giving out our fall crops in July. So we try to take care of you know, some of the timing logistics for you all as well. And then from there, you just have to hunt every plants or you know, plant them accordingly. And so, Getting into soil preparation and such, generally you want your soil to be dry or somewhat damp. When you're working with your soil, you don't want to plant your plants into soil that is too wet because that's going to, especially depending on the type of method you're planting, you know, will make planting a little bit harder to do. If you're using something like a earthway cedar or a pinpoint cedar, depending on the scale of garden that you're using, you know, you want to take into account, you know, how is that those conditions going to affect the tools that you're using? If you're using something like your hands to direct sow into the ground, you know, you might not have to worry about that too much, other than, you know, the stickiness or the ease of working with that wet soil. And then you also want to take into consideration the weather. So you can use this to kind of save yourself some time with watering. So if you got a planting that you want to do in a week. You might want to try and line that up with the rainstorm that might be coming the next day or maybe that later that day so that you can have your plants be watered by the rain, which is so much better than the city water or such that we have for watering or you know, getting your plants watered. So those are just some useful tips. And then you also want to pay attention to the weather in case that it's going to be a little bit too cold for your plants. So I mentioned harning off your plants. Generally, you want to try and get your plants planted when it's going to be consistently above or hovering around 45 to 50 degrees for your cold crops. Anything below that is a little bit harder for your plants to make it through. Seeds, plants that are started from seeds like your beets and carrots are definitely a lot more hardier. And so you can get those going, but your transplants your leafy greens and such that just came out the greenhouse are going to be a little bit less hardier and acclimated. So those need a little bit more time to get ready and so on. Hope. Sorry, Nadja, did you lose me for a sec? I still have you. Hold on. Okay, cool. Let me know if I need to repeat some things. Nope, we heard you. I heard you. Oh, perfect. Cool. All right. And so some of the, well, I guess that's a pretty much a general gist of what you all need to know for our cold crop introduction portion. We can uh, take this time to do some Q&A. So we're opening up the floor for questions now. Does anyone have any questions regarding 
anything Akello just mentioned, or do you have any questions about the cold crops, any of your leafy greens that you received the other day, or your broccoli, things like that? Do you know like the difference or why the broccoli is hardier than the leafy greens and things like that? Hey, I didn't know broccoli was hardier than leafy greens. Could you explain that, please? Mm -hmm. Yes. So by hardy, uh, meaning just you know how much cold tolerance that plant has. So when I was preparing our plants for you know hardening off, some hardening off we do take care of, where we you know put the plants outside and then we you know care for them during that seven day period where we try to keep them outside to get them ready for planting outside. You know I'm. You know, I feel totally fine with uh, putting out my collards, my kales, my broccolis, my cauliflower, also my cabbage outside, because those plants, you know, they could just take that. Plants that I'm a little bit more hesitant and more careful with are those plants that really don't have that, I'd say, structure or that, you know, that sturdiness that a typical, uh, you know, brassica family like your college and kills, you know, they're just more sturdier strength, stems and such. So things like lettuces, your bok choys, and even your celery, just because that one's a bit of a smaller plant, and then the bok choy is a lot more watery, if you will. Same with lettuces, those are a lot more flimsier. And so those plants, I'm just going to be a bit more careful with when I'm putting them outside. So let's say, for example, when you're going out to harden your plants with those ones, with those ones, I would just put outside during the day and then bring them inside over the night to let them just uh, you know, be protected from the colder weathers that we experience at night. And then crops like your brassicas, your collars, your kales, you know, I'm not too worried about those ones experiencing cooler temperatures. But if you are, you know, wanting to protect those a little bit more, you can use something like rime or a piece of fabric or cloth to, you know, protect them just a little bit overnight. And then if you are keeping those overnight and you might experience something like uh, snow or such, you can, you can bring them in or you can just uh, keep them covered. They'll be fine. We had the transplants that you all picked up today outside, minus the lettuce and the celery outside since uh, last Thursday and such. So any other questions or? Yes, we have a question from Odessa. Uh, her question is, what if my raised beds are not ready yet? Can the transplants last as if as is for, for a week or two? <clears throat> so if she doesn't put them in the ground <clears throat> right now or in her raised beds right now, are they yes. okay? That's a excellent question. So your transplants can last in there. You just have to make sure that you keep them watered and cared for during that period. So, you know, your transplants will start to, you know, silently scream at you that they're ready to be uh, potted up. And some of those signs look like, depending on the type of plant that you are looking at. So let's say you got a your broccoli transplant. If you Pull that plant out and look at the root systems. If you see that the root systems have like fully developed, it's more white than black, like the soil is, and that is a sign that your plant is becoming more root bound. And so what root bound is, is when your plant has kind of surpassed the spaces that's been given to it within that um, pot. And so now it's just you know taking up all the space that's in there to you know keep on growing, but ultimately hitting its limit. And so we want to avoid, you know, the plant figuring out or thinking that oh you know this is all the space I have, so let me you know do what nature needs me to do, which is you know go and seed and such, and you know ultimately become an adult and do all those things, reproduce and all of that, and thus you know jeopardizing the quality of your plant. And so, you know, keep checking on your plants. And, you know, once they get more developed, you can you can even you know take them out, look at the root systems, you know, during that two week period or so on, and you know, see and look at you know just what 
the uh, growth rate of your plant is moving at by just pulling out your plant, taking it out the pot, looking at those root systems, seeing if it's, you know, still mostly soil in there or if the uh, root systems are in there. They want to be gentle when you take your plants out the pot because just looking at the, the green and the top of your plant doesn't really tell you the full picture of what's happening with your plant. You want to if you're, if possible, you know, take your plant, look at the soil, look at the roots and have that be the telltale sign of when your plant needs to be potted up. And there'll also be signs of your plants becoming a little bit more browner on their leaves and such of them, oh, excuse me, of them needing to be potted up. And so just make sure that you keep your plants well watered and such during that two week period and they should be okay. Um, if you do have any nutrients or such that you have, like some type of you know, foliar spray, worm castings or so on to just help get that plant a little bit more energy that can help them last a little bit longer in those trays. All right. Um, could, 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 uh, <laughs> do you mind uh, saying the, 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 the fertilizers again or the nutrients oh. again? Yes. And those fertilizers that I mentioned, um, worm castings, that's an easy one. You can just sprinkle that on top of your, right on top of the soil and then water that in and that will slowly release into the plants. So that's one that's easily available. Um, another one that you can find is called blood meal or kelp. Those are all nitrogen fixing um, fertilizers. And worm castings, that's just derived from um, worm poop, basically. And it's uh, full of all type of nutrients is. Blood meal, that's basically uh, grounded up animal blood, dried out animal blood that releases nitrogen. And then kelp is derived from kelp. And that also is pretty high in nitrogen, so easily available um, nutrients is for you all. And, you know, within the mix that we have, so the soil mix that we use for the transplants this year is packed full of nutrients. Is, so I don't doubt that you all will have to fertilize your plants, especially if you plant them within the, uh, you know, desired time frame that we're giving you about a, a week or so after getting picking them up and hardening them off. And I'm trying to catch this question here. So she's asking about, are the mm -hmm. plants hardened already? Well, some of our Does plants have be been hardened off. Okay. So the ones that we've done, and it's okay to give them a little bit more time too, uh, if you, you know, need some time to get your garden ready or such. Um, plants that have been hardened off already are bok choy, our broccoli, our cauliflower, our dino kale, our curly kale, our collards, and cabbages. And the ones that have not been are the lettuces and the celery. And so you could think about that as just our lettuce and celery haven't been hardened off. All right. All Any right. Other awesome. questions? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to move into the next segment. We will have another question and answer situation. So if you have more questions, we'll get back to that in a moment. So Akello is going to keep on with the next portion of the lesson. All right. So now we'll be talking about soil preparation and a little bit on maintenance. So ideally, you take advantage of the free soil test that you get from Keep Growing Detroit, just so that you know what's the contents of your soil, what's the uh, nutrient potential of your soil as well for your plants so that you can know not only if you know, that soil is healthy enough for you, but also if that soil is healthy enough for your plants and so on. And then from there, then from there, the you can take it to so many levels once you have your you know, your nutrient data or so, you can go into, you know, super in depth with trying to figure out what that exact 
per pounds you need to put down on your plant so that you can get, you know, X amount of things. Or you can keep it really simple where you just add compost, you know, to your soil and mix that in. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's, you know, good enough to get your plants the nutrients that they need for that next season. Now, ideally, you are adding, you know, whatever nutrients you want to add, whether that's like rock phosphate or, you know, green sand, which has your um, potassium or so on, or even your compost. I say ideally those are added to your soil, you know, before the next season starts. So somewhere around October, November, you're mixing those things into the soil so that they have time to break down. And that's because a lot of these, you know, things that you add to your soil are slow releasing. And, you know, that's a lot more beneficial for the plants because, you know, they're also slow taking up too as well. Gives your plants a little, gives it, gives your soil a little bit of time to um, digest all those nutrients that you've added so that they're available for your plants, you know, in the future. And so those are just, ideally, um, you're still okay with, you know, still adding nutrients to your soil. They'll just still be slow releasing as your plants are still ready. And, you know, those nutrients will be available for your plants, you know, during the summertime, during August, October, and so on, you know, these are just ways for you to take, take advantage of the time frame that, you know, the cooler season of, or in the less pressure, I'd say for farming that the fall provides. And so in terms of like your own farm planning timeline, you know, try to get into the schedule of doing your soil preparation for next year, the year before during that fall season. And one of the things that we do on our farm, we get into the habit of getting our soil test done during the fall because that's when it's less competition to get a um, soil test back. Um, during this time of the year, there's a lot more soil tests that are getting sent off to labs. You know, our tests are getting sent off to labs during this time. At KGD, you can get your soil test done during any time of the year to, you know, get your one free soil test from us or other soil tests from us too. That can happen during any time of the year. But for our farm, we wanna try and do that during the fall. And then we try to do our bed prep and such during the fall or any type of amendments adding that during the fall. And another practice that we do, we try to keep our soils covered over the winter. We don't want to, um, you know, have all that soil preparation work undone, or at least have that harsh winter, you know, our soils to experience that harsh winter and also for weeds to grow um, over the winter. So we cover up our soils with uh, plastic. You can use things like wood chips. You can le use leaves because all of those are falling during the fall. And you can also use straw or hay. You just want to make sure that your soils aren't uncovered during the winter. And I'd say that straw, hay, you need, you know, biodegradable material is gonna be way better for your soils than plastic because plastic because that's easily available and easy to pull up and put down um, once the seasons change. But those really uh, biodegradable materials are gonna be a lot better for covering up your plants with. And then once the season starts, you can reuse those materials as much for your plants, which we'll get into. And so when you actually go and prep your soils, what you're shooting for is for your soils to be nice, softened, you know, fluffy for your plants to easily develop their root systems into for about, you know, six inches or so. And that can just look like going through a shovel, just flipping your soil, chopping up the soil and such. And, you know, at this point you can even add your compost into, you can chop that up. Make sure that that's nice and fluffy and then smooth it out with the rake so that your soil is nice and level. And if you're doing that during the fall, you, from that point, you could just cover it up with whatever material, wood chips, straw or such. And then let's say the winter comes and goes, when you pull that out and uncover all of that, you're ready for planting you know, for the next year without having to redo all that work or having to um, you know, come in and prep your soils over the winter. 
Now, all right. And there are other tools that you can use. You can use a broad fork. Um, at Keep Growing Detroit, we have a tool rental or tool share that you all can uh, come and borrow those types of tools from us. A broad fork is basically a pitchfork that's designed to aerate the soil and help make it fluffier. And, and it is a little bit easier for you. Now imagine some people might also have sod that they might need to remove for a garden space. We have a tool that's called the sod kicker that you can use. And oh, I gotta plug in my computer. Now you all can use a sod kicker to remove that soil. We also have that tool available for people to borrow from us. So I'll just have to get in contact with uh, Ramundo, who I'm trying to plug this in. Who bottomlines that portion of it? And we also have some tutorials on using a sod kicker as well. But it's really simple just to get your soil nice and fluffy. It is in a process that's uh, super complicated. Just, uh, oh, and also we have compost that's available from our hubs across the city. We have uh, Oakland Ave Farm and I believe Fight um, Mark Community Garden has some compost from us as well that people can pick up from. And let's see. And let me see if there's anything else from there. All right, and, oh, and yes, compost is available for all gardens. There are different amounts that are available, but we say, you know, help yourself and, you know, get what you need. And I wanna go into planting. So let's say that we're at our planting portion of our program excuse me, of our steps. And we wanna make sure that the soil is dry before we plant. So also checking our forecast, making sure that it's you know, not gonna, that it hasn't rained before or when it's gonna rain, you also wanna know that. And we wanna make sure that we harden off our plants so that they don't go through a shock period where they're you know, not growing. They're kind of like, oh, I'm in a new environment, trying to figure out you know, how to grow and so on. And so when we do come out and plant our transplants, we wanna make sure that we just make a hole that's you know, big enough for that root ball, you know, whatever size that root ball of the plant is, that's the size of the root ball that we need to make inside of the soil for that plant to grow. And then when we get it planted, we wanna make sure that we press it down firm so that it's not easily pulled out. If you give it a little bit of a tug, you wanna make sure that it you know, doesn't easily come loose. Because if you can easily pull it out just by hand and the wind or any type of animal or so on, you know, definitely pull that out quite easily. And then you also wanna make sure that you're planting your plants at the recommended spacing. Can't tell you how many times I've seen some tomatoes that are inches apart from each other. You wanna make sure that you're planting your plants correctly spaced apart and let me share with you all our plan your garden. So available for everybody at the distributions and even online, we have your, and we'll make this available through the follow email that we send with the class. We have your plan your garden sheet that really just goes down through the basics of your spacing, growing tips and so on. So everything that I'm talking about here, is all in this five page sheet with the breakdown of each of the crops. So when I'm saying your recommended spacings for your kills and so on, it's 12 to 18 inches. Now I'll also share this into the chat as well if anybody mm -hmm. wanted to click on it. Thank you, Naja. You're welcome. And, and then also there's a couple of different spacings for your direct sow trays direct sowed seeds as well. And so if you are working with seeds for crops that are multi-harvest, so things like your all greens mix, your lettuce mix, 
those ones you just want to show you know you want to sprinkle those down and so on but for crops like your single harvest crops like your beets carrots your radishes and turnips i recommend that you plant those within a line and you know there are some seeding recommendations that we give out on the on the actual seed packet and also in this sheet but one thing to to get around the the hassle of having to do you know thin your seeds if you're especially if you're direct sowing already like hand planting your plants you know you don't have to sprinkle them all in a line you know you can you know space them out while you're there so you can sprinkle them here have your three inches or so between your plants and then sprinkle them in that net spot so that you know you don't have to come behind and you know thin all your plants and you can even by doing that you're stretching out you know how many seeds you have available and usually when i'm doing that with my plants my beets my carrots my radishes and turnips you know sprinkling maybe two to three in a spot skipping a space so that they're already at that ideal stage and sprinkling a little bit more you know and so on and so forth instead of just you know sowing all those seeds in one spot and then having to come back and you know pluck out a bunch of plants and that's just if i'm you know hand sowing when i'm already you know giving my time and direct attention to it if i'm doing using something like an implement like an earthly cedar or so on and i'm just getting those seeds in the ground and then i'm gonna come back and bend them myself and once you have your plants planted you want to make sure that they don't dry out within that first week of planting them. And so that means that you're coming out and checking your plants daily or so and making sure that that soil is moist. And now how to check the soil. Usually if you can't see it by eye, you can, and if you haven't checked the weather or anything like that, you can always just come in with your thumb or such and put your hand inside the soil and you know check your hand if it's uh, all saturated and it feels wet and your soil is wet, you don't need to water, but if it feels dry or so on, then that is a sign that you need to water your plants. And so we'll open up for some questions and check the chat. All righty, so we covered soil and planting seeds. Were there any questions about that? How are you all preparing your soil or what have you done to get your soil ready for your cold crops? Uh, uh, go ahead. No, please go ahead. I just had a question about seeding on one of the videos. I saw this tool that looked like a block with prongs or something. Is that something that's ready available or something you guys just made or? And a block with tongs. Yeah, and they like pressed it down. So it looked like the, uh, well, tongs or spikes looked like they were, the spikes were evenly spaced on this block. They pressed it into the soil and mm. then put the seeds in from, you know, after that. It was on one of the, uh, one of the Keep Growing Detroit planting videos. Not familiar. I can't tell you which one right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that we do have our Earthway Cedar available for people to use. Now, the Earthway Cedar, I can pull up a picture of it right now so that we can, uh, and also if you can uh, find a picture of it as well, we can get a link in and try to get a better picture of it too. So one okay. moment, let's try and pick that up and see if we have this. And, and this was a handheld device, so. Handheld. Yeah. Mm. Was it for transplant or seeds? It was for seeds. For seeds. Mm. I... I'll search for it so that yeah, you don't please. have to hold people up. Go ahead. I got you. Mm -hmm. All right. And I'm just going to show the Earthway Cedar on the screen. Okay. Wow, the next question's coming. Okay. Did someone else had a question? Um, 
Yeah, uh, I, I was, <clears throat> I was wondering if there are any um, uh, uh, soil resources, like um, for raised beds, besides just compost. Like, are there any places to get a large quantity of soil delivered? I can share with you, uh, have you on, on the, in the garden, garden resource program, we do have a guide to garden resources for the members. Do you have access to that? I do, I do. Okay, so I'll, I'll just share that again in the uh, chat and that just shows like a few different of the resources that we do have. If you don't see what you're looking for on that, you can shoot us an email because we do have some other resources that we may be able to connect you with. Okay, th thank you. You're welcome. I'll add that to the chat for you. All right. Any other questions? And uh, if you're still searching for that cedar, uh, feel free to bring it up at the next point during sure. our uh, break. I have I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, in regards to the soil testing, um, they said it was available on Tuesdays. Is there a certain time? That the drop off is that it, there is a certain time. Do you know that time at the little I don't know that time, but uh, if you can, that's a Romando question. Mm -hmm. That's Romando's question. But if you um, you can always drop your uh, soil test off the farm, and we can uh, get it to there. If that doesn't work in the time frame, so we're at the farm usually between nine and three, and just make sure that you have your you know, your entire di diagram um, completed that one page your sheet and that your soil is in a, uh, you know, a plastic bag for us. And then we'll get it done from there. And then no, Sarah dropped in the chat for us too from one, two, three. From all I think that will. Yeah, I think it's from 11 to one. Okay. Drop off. Okay, thank you. I also have a question, um, and you might be covering this soon when you get more into. But um, I, I recently moved into an apartment. It had a giant bed in the back, and there may not be maggots in the bed. I can't really tell, um, but I'm a little worried to use that soil because I know that they attack roots. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you could recommend about that, but is that a raised bed? Yes. Oh, I, I say, you know, go in there by hand and, you know, comb through that soil. Just go through and, you know, see for yourself, go through and, you know, use a pitchfork or a shovel and such and just flip that soil, you know, disturb those maggots and whatnot. You know, they really like to be not disturbed. And so what we want to do is, you know, put them in uncomfortable positions and, and if it's a really small bed, you know, that's really, um, you know, that will be light work, um, depending. And so that's a, uh, that's a, a simple, straightforward recommendation just to uh, go in there and see how those maggots are doing. And then what if there is an infestation, like? Mm -hmm. If there is an infestation. Well, from that point, I'd say, let's figure out what our threshold is. So one to two, you know, maggots or such, I'd say that's, uh, you know, not really a huge problem. But if you have something more like, you know, 15 or 10 or so maggots, you know, even to a uh, point and and how they seed themselves or seed themselves, how they, I guess, plant themselves in the soil, if you will, they don't really plant in huge masses. They're probably like ones or two Z's all over the place. And so those are, you know, honestly really simple creatures that, especially in a raised bed setting where it's already elevated, separated from the soil, you know, really easy for us to just come in there by hand and, you know, self-remove that plant or excuse me, self-remove that insect. And so if that is an infestation that you're seeing year by year, I recommend from that point that you try to you know, keep your soils covered as much as possible using 
cardboard or such so that the maggots don't really have access to the soil once they're ready for, or well, whatever fly or insect that that maggot is, once it's ready for, you know, trying to use the exact terms, you know, planting its seeds inside the soil itself. And so try to keep it a little bit covered up once you do your work of uncovering those plants, or excuse me, uncovering those insects. So to recover that with cardboard or something a little bit more sturdier, wood chips or such, should be good enough to get you going for those. So you mean, I'm sorry, you mean cover like at the bottom of the Covered bed? at the top layer. Oh. So in their life cycle, that insect comes up out of the ground, it goes, flies around. Yeah. That's what it does. And then when it's ready at the end of the season, it goes find some soil, plants its seeds, ideally where there's something going to be tasty for it when it comes out the ground. And so by you covering that, you know, you're denying that insect, you know, access to that soil. Huh. So that you can stop that cycle. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anyone else with a question? Well, I have a question for the group. <laughs> so has anyone else experienced any uh, challenges related to your soil preparation or planting techniques? Has anybody uh, put any of their cold props into the ground yet, the ones you received uh, yesterday or Tuesday? No. Any issues arise? No issues. Everybody's professionals. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, great. I have, Everybody uh, here. <laughs> I have a question. I put it in the chat. And okay. I do, do, do container gardening. So mm -hmm. my question is, it's about the plants uh, and the size of the container and how many specific plants can you put in a certain con container? Mm -hmm. So when figuring that out, what I would do is go to our recommended uh, spacings here on our planter garden instruction sheet. And so mm -hmm. let's look at a Kelly Kell and Dino Kell, so it's basically the same thing. So if you can't put your plants, you know, in their ideal spacing apart from each other, so let's say you got a, you know, maybe a four inch circumference um, or diameter pot, and you plant one kale plant in there, um, you know, we can't get another kale plant in there because they need to be about 12 to 18 inches apart. And so that's what I would do to, you know, figure out how much spacing I have. If you can't give them, you know, that depending on the type of plant, if you can't give them that spacing that they ideally would need apart from each other, okay. then just having one plant inside that pot. But you definitely have a lot more room when it comes to things like your lettuces and your direct sowed plants, like your, I'm trying to find some more. <clears throat> Like your beets and carrots, you can have multiple of those plants inside of a pot because they don't really need that much space. They only take about four inches to three inches, excuse me, three to four inches apart from each other. Same with carrots and a lot more space with herbs as well. Okay. All right. Um, I, I have a question about, um, what is it? Uh, row covering. Mm -hmm. it, is it if if I were to put row covering over them from the very beginning um, and just keep it on there? Um, mm -hmm. Would that would that deter um, aphids? I've had aphid problems in the past, um, like major infestation with the brassicas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The white ones? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we are approaching our pest management portion. Maybe we should, I'll answer your question before, but we will segue after that into our pest management portion. But to your question about aphids, <clears throat> first things that we want to know about the pest that we're trying to deter is its life cycle. And thus, by understanding its life cycle, we'll glean into how to 
when to best deal with that plant and how to best deal with that plant. So aphids, they don't overwinter here. They don't make it through our winters. They fly in from the uh, southern winds and such when they come up here. And, you know, that's how they get on their plants. They're also asexually reproducing. Some of them do fly, but generally a lot of them don't develop wings and fly off and such. And then they just stick on plants. And so what's the key point that we uh, just touched on there or what we just learned from their life cycle? They fly in. And so by putting up something like Remay, you know, we deny them access to our plants and such. And so Remay is an excellent, you know, preventive measure to put on your plants, especially for those insects that fly in. Now, and that's your, you know, quick answer for aphids and such. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we get into the uh, pest portion, but any other questions on soil and planting? All right. Ready. <clears throat> Moving on to our pest management. So pest, in that I include insects, diseases, animals, uh, fungus and such. And so how do you protect your plants from those in general? So first it's good to know that insects and even some animals just become more and more active as the weather gets warmer. Um, this is called their degree days. And so basically that means that when a when the temperature hits a certain degree consistently, you know, that insect will hatch, it will come out the ground, it will, you know, begin to fly and become more active and so on. And so if you have all kind of, you know, been feeling the weather and such and been looking outside at the garden, like you might've seen like your first cabbage looper moth flying about, or you might've seen your first butterfly within the past two weeks or so or you might've seen your first fly outside or your first mosquito. You know, that's just like your first one. Soon you'll see multiple mosquitoes, multiple cabbage slipper moths, hopefully not, you know, flying around or multiple aphids and such. And, you know, they're just moving with the weather, becoming more active with the weather. And so by knowing that, you know, it's also a, uh, a cue from nature for us to prepare for, get prepared for preemptively put things in place so that those insects, you know, don't find, you know, food to sustain themselves or our food at least to sustain themselves. And so degree days are super important for farmers to, <clears throat> to know when to and when to handle a insect and such. And, and then from there, it's also good, I just mentioned, knowing the life cycle of your insects. I'm gonna pull up a screen here of some common insects that we see. Oh, let me make sure I pull out the right screen. Here we go. All right, let me make sure that everybody can see. Perfect, okay. And so we just don't want to know that, okay, this, uh, for example, the cabbage looper worm or the cabbage looper moth, it, you know, it flies by and we just see the, the white butterfly flying and it's not a butterfly, but I grew up calling it a butterfly and, you yeah. know, that just flies around and so on. You know, if you ever tried to catch one, it's pretty hard to catch and such, but when they go and lay their eggs on brassicas, that's what they typically like to snack on, their insects, that's what attracts them. When they come and lay their eggs, um, at least for the white moth, those eggs are typically either yellow or orange or such, and they try to lay them on the other side of, or the bottom facing side of the leaves, and then those hatch into the 
worms and such that we uh, bane and such. And so in that description, when would it be easiest to deal with that cabbage looper moth or that cabbage with the worm or egg? What portion or what cycle of its life cycle would it be easier to handle that pest? And this is a question for the group. When it's a caterpillar? When it's a caterpillar, when it can't really move that much, the only defense that it has is that it's green and that it kind of camouflages with the uh, with the plant that it's on. And so from that point, what we could do as farmers is figure out what's our, you know, what tools do we have available for that? If you're growing, you know, one or two or even three or four, depending on, you know, your own capacity, you know, it might not be too much for you just to, you know, go outside every day or so when you're watering your plants or every week or so when you're watering your plants to go outside and, you know, hand pick any cabbage looper worms or you know, fully check your plants and then just hand pluck those, feed them to the chickens if you have any chickens or you can just uh, squish them if you're comfortable squishing them or you could just take them off your plants and you know, throw them in the field. They're pretty slow moving and birds will get them for sure. You know, very simple, straightforward thing to do. On larger scales, um, we also, implement and you can also implement things like reme because the cabbage looper moth it doesn't overwinter here it flies in as well from the warmer climates and so you can deny your plant deny that insect access to your plant but keeping your plants covered so that means that when you're going out to harvest that plant or care for your plant that you uncover them and cover them right back up when you're working with that plant to deny them access. And then another tool that we use, we also use a spray for them at the farm, at least at our farm. We use a spray that's called BT, Baxivius thuracis. BT for short, because that is a long Latin name for that, um, for that spray. <clears throat> and that is a organic approved use spray that is you know, derived from plants. And what that does is basically it's a, uh, it's a spray that gets sprayed on top of your vegetables. And once the cabbage looper moth eats that, it's poison for it. And then it uh, ends up pretty much dying from that. And then it's also biodegradable so that once the sunlight hits it, it's no longer on your plants. And then of course you should apply that in the recommended um, amounts within that. But that is something that large scale farms use just to simply go in on an afternoon, spray their plants and then you know, let the insects eat what they like. And then they you know, pretty much die off, but that's not like a one-time thing. Um, farms typically have a spray schedule even before they start to see damage on their plants to come again and consistently spraying their plants about once a week or so throughout that growing season, just to keep that higher quality. Now, <clears throat> let's go to, I just want to show a different screen that I saw was interesting, that I think it's pretty helpful. This right here is um, flea beetles. They had an interesting sheet here about figuring out what's your threshold. Now, as a culture, we have, or at least just going to the grocery store and picking up food. You know, we haven't really seen, uh, I guess, real food in a in a way where it's uh, all pristine and all of that. You know, food comes in all different types of um, ways. Especially if you've been growing food, you know, sometimes your vegetables have blemishes on it, insects have eaten it, and so on. But it's you know still good food. You know, they just took their share. <laughs> And so, you know, we've become, you know, used to seeing, you know, really perfect, beautiful looking food, which isn't a bad thing, but, you know, we haven't given, you know, food that's perfectly fine within the 30 and 50% so that don't look kind of holy and such a chance 
And so by growing our own food, we really start to see what the realities are like, especially dealing with insects and animals of like, uh, you, know, you gotta get what you get when you're growing your own food. And sometimes it's not always perfect. You know, there are things that we can do, but you know, that food might not be perfect for sale, but it's still, you know, perfect for consumption. And so this right here is just an example of uh, figuring out what's your threshold. So as farmers, or at least personally me, you know, I was giving an example with the, um, with the maggots. If I see a couple of maggots, ones or twos or threes, totally fine, that's all a part of nature. But if I'm seeing, you know, numbers within the 30s or the 40s or so on, you know, then I can see that infestation where I have to go out and do something about it. You know, I'm not going to react to just seeing, you know, one mosquito, one cabbage super moth, one flea beetle, or so on, you know, I'm gonna, you know, let nature, you know, let nature be basically, and, you know, share their harvest in some ways. But if I see, you know, a little bit more than what I can, you know, handle or what we could take, or, you know, we're not sharing their harvest anymore, <laughs> then you have to, you know, take those preventative measures. And I also wanna mention that there are some insects that do overwinter, like your flea beetles and like your maggots and such, where they're gonna be boring into that soil or sometimes living within the root systems of last year's plants. And so from there, ways that we can get around that is by utilizing something called a crop rotation, where we're not planting the same plants in the same areas by like families and such. So like your cucurbits, your cucumbers, your squashes, your melons and such, I'm gonna move those to a different area so that those soil-borne insects, you know, when they come out and try to find them, they can't, you know, easily find them. And let's also put that in combination with putting down some cardboard, putting up that reme, you know, then we're isolating our plants just so that we can get to them and not those insects and such. Those are some really simple, straightforward things that you can do and really some straightforward um, backhand knowledge that you could keep in mind as you're dealing with insects and as you're you know, farming with insects too. And let's see if there's anything else that I've missed here. Nope, I'd say that's good. I can open this up for some questions. All right, anyone has any questions about that? Have you had any experience or any um, issues with bugs when you're planting or pests or anything like that? No questions? Yeah, I, I, I've i just had um, issues with the, I don't know if it was the cabbage looper moth because it wasn't, uh, the diamondback one, but the white one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, the aphids <clears throat> and then the, uh, um, it's not it's not related to cold crops, but that great mm -hmm. big green caterpillar on tomato plants. Oh, the tomato hornworm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a beauty. Those are my you favorite. You're like, wow. <laughs> Those are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> So let's go down the list. So the, yeah, I kind of loop in here, the, the cabbage, the moth, the, all those, the little green moth, little green caterpillars, you know, they all like the same thing. So I kind of loop those in with each other and how they're handled is very much the same. Now for this, I try to push people to do more preventative measures versus more remedial or reactive things, because that's just you, you know, taking time out of your day now, instead of, you know, handling it when you planted your plants. So like when you get your plants planted to the ground, setting up your remay, putting down your cardboard, your wood chips or so on to keep those plants, <clears throat> to keep those insects and such away from them. You know, do those things then so that you don't have to deal with those insects then. And if you do have to, or if you're in the point where, you know, it's just past your threshold, uh, the preventative measures that you did, you know, they just didn't stand up to it. Then that's when you pull out, you know, those synthesized really strong chemicals and so on. Um, even the natural things are still chemicals. And so 
for the Cabbage Super Moth, the the BT that is a really, um, really much what we use on the farm. Really, what a lot of organic farms use as well. Um, that's just a spray that you can spray at the end of the day, and such a thing for the aphids. Um, really common, um, naturally derived as well. Um, neem oil that you can spray in your plants. It's a lot more oily. And so what you have to do to make sure that it works when you put it together in a spray bottle or make sure, remember that you have to emulsify the neem oil because it's very oily. And so that means that you're mixing that oil up with soap to just help make it uh, you know, bind with those water molecules and so on and so. Make sure that those are well mixed together and emulsified before you start to use it as a spray. And then super important for that neem oil that you don't leave that neem oil on your plants because that can really clog up the pores of your plants and stop them from breathing and so on and so. Say you spray your neem oil at night because you don't want to spray that oil on your plants during the day, you'll just toast your plants. So the next morning or so, <clears throat> you come through and just uh, wash your plants off with um, like your like your watering gun with a sprinkler or so on so that you get that oil off of your plants. And if you are having some trouble getting that oil off your plants, then use a cloth or such in combination to wash your plants off or rub your plants off. That's <clears throat> another thing, uh, another stronger um, chemical that you can use that's also organically approved is called Safer. Safer is what we also use at the farm for our hot crop transplants. And again, we're, you know, we're doing these things weekly. So it's not just a one-time application and we're also not doing it before we see them. We're doing it, you know, before the problem happens or before those insects get there. Cause it's also a deterrent because the insects aren't gonna, you know, the, the mother isn't gonna plant its, those babies there if it's not edible food there. And so you can also preemptively spray your plants once a week or so does take a little bit more time, but you are guaranteeing a, a higher quality of produce at the same time. And so safer spray, it's another spray very much similar to BET, but this one is more so for aphids and such. And it's also kind of a generalist spray as well, but more so for um, soft shelled, soft bodied insects. And so there are a couple other insects that even BT is used for, and also safer is used for same for neem oil. So there's some overlap there with some of those plants, some of those um, sprays. But that one is just uh, applied just like BT. You add it with water and then you spray it on your plants. You can use a ad spray, excuse me, a spray bottle or so on, depending on your scale. Really simple. Ah, and getting to the tomato hornworm, which is a yeah, if you search BT um, insecticide, you'll find it. Just looking at the chat there. Um, getting to the tomato hornworm, which I experienced for the first time at my farm school back in 2016. It's like the biggest, <laughs> the biggest caterpillar I've ever seen. Um, what you want to look for, because they do blend in, right? All these insects, they're, they're, they're camouflaging, they're green, and they're mixing in with the foliar color. And so what you want to look for is damage first. So all those holes in your plants, like that's going to be your, you know, your first cookie crumbs to the clues of where that insect is. And so specific to the tomato hornworm, it's really big, but it blends in. You want to look for plants that are, or excuse me, parts of your tomato plants, your pepper plants, and they're really on mostly tomato plants. Um, I've seen them on pepper plants. They're more of a solanaeum loving insect or more so tomato plants you'll see them on. Um, you wanna look for areas that look like, you know, they've just been eaten up. And so that's gonna point you to the direction of where that tomato hornworm is. And usually what I do with my staff and we have about, you know, multiple rows of, 70 foot rows of tomatoes planted um, it's really just, uh, and also volunteers too, we just take time out our day, say, 
and we're just looking for tomato hornworm. So we've seen this. We're just going to go through and just walk and pick them up our to, off of our uh, off of our plants. And ooh, I just remember something that sounds cool. And you just look for those signs of damage, and then you just check your plants nice and slowly. And literally, all you got to do is just hand pick that tomato hornworm. One thing that you can also do is a homemade spray for the tomato hornworms. They really don't like peppermint oil. It's, it's basically like an acid to their skin. And so you can make a homemade peppermint oil that you spray if you see damage, you know, on your tomato plants or on around, you know, that area if you can't find your tomato hornworms and you can just spray that around your plants your tomato plants and that will uh um if you <laughs> that will be a uh a home way homemade way to um get that tomato hornworm i want to show you all tomato hornworm there is a um I'm trying to remember the correct term a parasite that is a beneficial there's a moth or a um hornet that is a parasite that well, it, on the tomato hornworm, that insect, it uh, plants its babies on the ho tomato hornworm, and then the babies grow amongst the tomato hornworms, and it's kind of like a parasite to them. And it's a pretty cool thing to see. I don't know, tomato. But in the meantime, are there any other questions or follow-ups about that? I just wanted to say, if you do have an experience with the tomato hornworms and they eat up off, eat your plant up, don't throw your plant away because it will rejuvenate. Don't think, like, oh my God, I just lost my plant. Like, it will come back. <laughs> so get rid of the worm, but don't get rid of the plant. Let's see if I can find this one. All right, any other questions? Uh, here we go. Can I, mm -hmm, please? Can I plant peppermint with the tomatoes? Would that help? Mm, it's more so the synthesized oil. So mm -hmm. that really strong oil that really uh, they don't like. Okay. I've actually tried uh, planting basil around my tomato plants because they don't like basil either. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it took a minute, but they did eventually make their way to the top of the plant. But when I did remove them, if I had tomato in my hand, they like literally would scream because <laughs> they don't like. <laughs> they really don't yeah. like so if you could get them like tall enough or close enough to it, you know, they can uh, it would deter them. Like I said, but the ones last year, it just took them some time to get to the top, but <laughs> they'll, they'll figure out a way. I know, they're, they're very uh, much so a surreal animal to interact with. Uh, but this is just a picture or an example of, you know, nature at work here, our ecosystem at work. A, let's see, a tomato hornworm. Trying to see if they show me the name of the plant, but you know, an insect, you know, uses the tomato hornworm as a pretty much a host for it. And these are the little eggs here. And so basically those eggs are feeding off the tomato hornworm. And you know, basically the hornworm has basically stopped feeding at that point. It's just become basically food for all of those insects. And I've seen that multiple times where, you know, I'm like, okay, well. We got tomato hornworms, but you know all those hornworms that I've seen, you know, all have this. Even while we're going through and you know hand picking and so on, you know, you can still see, you know, nature at work working within its cycles of, you know, predator and prey, as well. So that's just a a cool thing to um, see really nature at work there. But hornworms, um, you know, the benefit of them, you know, although they are quite the past, you know, they're big. And so it's, in some cases, easier to see versus your uh, 
cabbage loop or moth and such. And then you can also see they eat big too. So if you go in there and you know catch them before they get going, you know their signs are quite prevalent, especially if you're checking your plants uh, fairly often. All right, <clears throat> let's. All right, any more questions about the pest before we move on to the next segment? All right, let's go to the next segment. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Cynthia, you have your hand raised or did we already get to you? Cynthia, you're muted. Yeah, okay. sorry, <laughs> thank you. I uh -huh. just picked up, um, and I'm sorry if you've addressed this earlier, you can skip over it. I was not able to join until just now, but I just picked up the cold crop transplants and I'm getting ready to put them out gradually to start hardening them to the temperature and the light. And I'm wondering if you have any tips or suggestions for keeping bugs from getting to them, you know, while they're initially setting out. It seems like we've done that in the past. And by the time we get them to the garden, they're already infected. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So what we shared so far, um, all of the cold crops, but the lettuce and the celery have been hardened off. That you picked up from us. So, if you don't want to, if you don't want to, if you want to forego the waiting period for those crops, go for it. But cool. You can also let those ones. You know, if you want to have those ones heart um, harden off some more, totally fine. Or you know, if you want to match those to when you want to plant them, go for it. Now, with uh, keeping the insects away from them, what you can do, if you picked up remay. You can use your remay and just set it up around your plants, or you can use something like a sheet or cloth to basically just be a barrier from plants. And you can just set that up yourself as long as it's breathable for your plants. You know, that'll do totally fine under there. And yeah, so just setting up a barrier for your plants, I think, should be good enough for your plants to um, stay protected from other insects. Yeah, I have good success using the tool netting uh just in closing my plants in the tool netting um especially the container plants thank you all right and then uh cynthia we've also shared that uh, you also want to do your preventative measures too so in the beds that you're also planting them using things like once you get them planted, cardboard or such, or wood chips to kind of deter those soil borne insects, you know, opportunities to come out of the ground and so on. And then also setting up remay right after you plant your plants or some type of insect netting or so on above your plants to keep those insects away. Let's see. Okay, moving on to more follow-up on our planting and maintenance. And so, yeah, once your plants are in the ground, don't forget about them. Um, you need to, I suggest going out there and checking on them at least once a day after they have been planted for about a week. And so just getting out there, getting into the habit of you know, looking after your plants, they're, they're basically, you know, they're basically babies that are quite needy, especially in that first week of life where they haven't really established their root systems yet, or they're still like experiencing shock from just being planted in a new space and such. And so it's going to take them some time to get, you know, self-efficient or at least, you know, somewhat self-efficient where their root systems are able to pull out water, you know, from the earth and such without you having to add too much water. Now, if it's not going to rain, you'll definitely want to be out there, you know, watering your plants um, daily and such. So just mentioning those root systems are getting established and to make sure that your plants do not dry out during that first week period. And this is doubly so for your transplants, for your direct sow crops. I typically water my direct sow crops once a day until I see them starting to emerge from the soil. And so that 
involves the background knowledge of knowing what those first cotyledon leaves, those starter leaves of those plants look like so that you're not confusing them with weeds that are growing. And so, yeah. And that's also how you speed up the germination rate of those plants like your carrots, your beets, which typically take a long time for those to germinate. Um, this year, I was able to get some very quick turnaround germination on my beet seeds and got those popping, uh, popping or showing and germinating in about a week or so. Just because I was going out there and watering them every day, checking on them, looking at them, making sure they weren't drying out. And this was, they, I think I saw them literally pop uh, probably about Thursday or so over the weekend. And we planted those a week before then. Now for carrots, those take about you know, almost a week to two weeks to fully germinate. And so those are typically just a slow crop. So, you know, keep on watering those. If you ever had trouble getting your carrot seeds to germinate, it's because they probably experienced some type of dry period that kind of set them back or affected their germination rate. For your turnips, your radishes, really, really vigorous, um, easily germinating brassica. And so those ones you shouldn't have too much issue with. Those usually germinate within less of a week. So maybe about five days or so if you're consistently watering those plants. And that's just so that you make sure that you get, you know, the highest percent of germination from those seeds. And germination, when I say that, meaning that, you know, the, the embryo is emerging from the seed coat and developing and so on. All right. And so after your plants have, you know, after that first week for your transplants, so if you consistently watering them, you should start to see some new growth happen on your plant. If you see some new growth happening, that means that your plant is new growth, meaning that from the, the growing point of your plant, you can start to see that you know, little more leaves are starting to pop out or starting to come. You know, that means that your plant is no longer experiencing shock. They're going, you know, they're all through the hardened off area. They're, they're used to the environment that they're in. They're like, okay, I can do this. You know, there, you can slow down on watering your plants consistently every single day. They don't really need that much water or not as much water as every day from that point. And again, to emphasize, uh, when you go out and check your plants, it doesn't mean that you, you have to water every single day. You just wanna make sure that they don't dry out. So we shared that uh, you wanna stick your finger in the soil or you know, check the weather or such to see if it rained or not, or you know, just touch and feel the soil so that you know if it's moist or not for your plants. If it is moist, you know you don't have to water that day. If it's dry, then you should water that day. And so when I do my farm training for my staff, you know, I tell them that we don't have a schedule. We work with nature. We're out here checking every single day, making decisions on what we should do every single day so that we don't, <clears throat> you know, because nature changes every single day, or at least the weather changes every single day and conditions are conditional. And so just have that in the back of your mind as you're uh, caring for your plants. And so as your uh, root, plants start to develop, your seeds start to um, germinate and such for your direct sow crops, you can slow down on your watering and let your plants, let your plants experience a, and definitely this is more so for the soil, experience a dry period or such for a little bit as well. It's not always gonna be good for that soil to stay um, wet <clears throat> because at that point we're almost kind of encouraging more so bacteria or fungi growth at that point. And also we're not allowing our plants to really stretch or develop their root systems because all the water that they need is always there. And so if they don't have to go that far for that nutrients, then, you know, we're gonna be kind of handicapping our plants. And so we kind of want our plants to work a little bit. And so that's how we're gonna, we're gonna you know, slow down on all that watering a little bit, go down to once or twice a week for that plant. You know, so that they can get some 
you know, real world experience too, if you will. Our, our, our babies are not college students. They need to get out in the world. And so, you know, that's kind of how I treat my watering gum. You still want to go out and check your plants every day and keep an eye on them. And we don't want the soil to be wet, but we do want the soil to be damp. Um, plants can't uptake nutrients from dry soils. They need that relationship with water and so on to, um, to uptake nutrients from the soils. And so as long as that soil is damp, that's what we're looking for. We don't want it to be too wet. We don't want it to be too dry. And so we're just, and then there's also, so there's a lot of things in combination that are working here with uh, growing plants. The dry period is also important for pushing back fungi and diseases and such from growing on your plants. But it's also gonna be important that your plants stay moist too so that they can get nutrients as well. And then also that wetness is important for the soil because that's how soil activates itself. So it isn't really activated when it's dry and so on. And so there are a lot of different things that are uh, taking place within your plants and within the soil. Uh, while you're watering. And also, tip, you don't water your plants, you water the soil when you're watering. Um, although the water is you know, good for your plants to fill and such, the, the, real, the real action is all happening underneath the soil. And if you ever noticed when water falls on leaves, usually that's being all directed or redirected to where the stems are of your plants. All right, let's see. Okay. All right, we can open this up for some questions now. All right, any questions on that, anyone? If not. Um, I, I have a question for uh, irrigation. Uh -huh. Um, because I'm trying, you know, I'm thinking about like cost savings with water usage and just the high rates with the mm -hmm. yeah. city water. Um, and also, um, uh, just a question like, is it more efficient? I mean, there's initial startup costs, but is it more efficient for the plant as well? to do a drip line or soaker line? Um, and if so, what would your recommendation be in regards to a drip line versus soaker line? Uh -huh. Well, I recommend that, well, I prefer drip irrigation. And that's what we use on our farm. We've also used things like uh, sprinklers as well, but there's just a lot more water going in places that we really don't need it to go when we're using um, over here irrigation. And there are some cases where I do prefer um, over here irrigation, like when I have a hose and a wand and I'm able to, you know, water is going where I want it to go by my direction. And so I use multiple things on my farm. So when I'm getting plants first established, making sure that they're in a germinate or not, because, uh, well, I'll get to that in a sec. But when you're first getting your plants established, it's good to you know, be able to be there and be able to see your plants. And I'm really able to do that when I'm going out there and hand watering my plants when they first get established. And that's really awesome. Me, you know, forming more of a connection to my plants and also going out there and looking at them, you know, every single day or every other day when I have to water them when they're first getting established. And then as they become more and more adult, and at some point you can set up your drip irrigation earlier and it can look in all different types of ways. You can have a PVC system where you, you know, have some PVC pipes and you drill some holes in it and then you have a water, water hose that flows into that and releases water at a certain rate at a certain distance each time. That's a really easy way. Um, we have some, basically some blue lay flat. That's the term for the hoses that we use, it's basically like fire hydrants, but more so for the farm that we use that uh, feeds into drip irrigation black tape. 
that releases at certain periods and that we set up. And so what I like to do is after my plants have become established and a little bit more hardier, I set up that drip irrigation on my plants and I have about 30 inch beds. And what I like to do, and when I am shifting us too, we used to have two drip lines spaced out evenly amongst a 30 inch bed. Now I'm gonna have three, three drip lines spaced out between a 30 inch bed and your system, you know, can definitely look different from that. But that's just me making sure that water evenly gets spaced out amongst that 30 inch bed and that we don't have too many dry spots. All right, so from that point, I am, you know, drip irrigating and the general rule of thumb, what they tell you as you're growing up as a farmer or so on, that you want to put down at least one acre inch of water. And that's basically, you can test that by, you know, putting your finger within the soil. And then if it's moist amongst a inch of your finger, then that's your one acre inch of water down in your plants. Really simple way to get towards that or a practical, easy way to figure that out. And so I'm using a combination of overhead watering my plants when they're first getting established, setting up that drip irrigation, and when I'm just able to turn that on, let that run for about an hour or so. And this is also an important part too. You don't want to put down that acre inch of water all at the same time. Or you don't want to just, you know, water your plants all at the same time in a week or so. You know, nature doesn't work like that. Plants aren't used to that. You're, you're basically flooding your plants at that point. You want to put down just a little bit every spaced out now and then so that the soil is just nice and moist for them, not too wet, not too dry. For them, it's almost like the Goldilocks theory, if you will. And so one practice that we're going to be using on the farm is no longer doing like your two hour or three hour watering sessions, we're going to be having more so one hour watering periods that happen you know, every other day for our plants so that they can stay consistently moist where they're able to you know, pick up nutrients and so, and they still have that drying out period on those off days and such. So hopefully what I'm giving you there is more so some background if you're to think about with your own watering system and practices. Uh, let me know if there's any follow up. All right, we have a question from Penny. Uh, Odessa says, super helpful, thankful. Thank you, she's thankful. Okay, so Penny is asking, last year her cauliflower turned brown. Um, is that due to overwatering? At what point did you cauliflower turn brown? You're just talking about the actual, uh, I guess, the part that we eat of that plant or the entire part of that plant, the leaves turn brown, all of that. And like, there's a lot that goes into diagnosing plants. So I'm curious, um, when did your cauliflower turn brown exactly? And also, which part of the cauliflower turned brown? And until I get that, I'll say cauliflower is a pretty hard plant to get to, um, you know, successfully grow. Okay. And they do want to be a lot more careful with that plant, especially with their watering. My first experience with the cauliflower was with my farm school out in uh, Lansing, um, Michigan, pretty much Holt, Michigan. And so we grew cauliflower, but we grew it in uh, pretty much muck soils. And so that was always wet. And thus for us, it didn't really, the heads didn't really get that big for us. Not so much turning brown was our issue, but the heads weren't uh, that big. So <clears throat> I say, I'm also gonna add this to the last thing that I, shared um, along with your own watering um, setups. And so that you also keep that soil covered from the sun. You wanna make sure that you keep that soil protected from that sun looking 
and that could look like putting down cardboard, wood chips, and such. So, you know, those are good for, you know, protecting your soils from insects and so on, but it's also good for locking in that moisture. And, you know, if you see, well, if you like, you know, leave, well, if you go outside and look out right now, or if you have some bare soil, you can see weeds starting to pop up on your plants. You know, that's nature protecting itself from the sunlight. You know, although the sun does many beneficial things, it also, you know, does some other things too that aren't so beneficial for plants as well. And so specifically for soil, it dries out the soil. So you can see weeds starting to grow and such on your plants, and that's just them covering that soil, protecting it. And so when we are planting, you know, sometimes we have a lot of bare soils in our farming practices, you know, cover up those plants. You know, sometimes if you're not planting anything, let those weeds grow so that they can protect that soil when you're not, you know, working that field or that bed or whatnot. You know, weeds have their purpose too and such. And so when you're having your drip irrigation, you know, put something on top of that drip irrigation or something on top of that soil, whether it's a piece of plastic or cloth to protect that. And then getting to your cauliflower. Um, yeah, with cauliflower, you're definitely gonna have to, you know, put a little bit more attention into making sure that that crop is successful. Ah, here we go. Got a little bit more information. Hmm. Okay. All right, depending on what I recommend for, you know, this try this year. And this happened, I sent to all of the cauliflower. Definitely keep a journal on, you know, the practices and stuff and such that you do for your plants. You know, we are, there are, how we break it down in farmer um time frames this week right now this is week 16 within the year we break it down by 52 weeks in a year and so keep a journal of your farm practices so that you can look back and be able to say or you know be able to share out exactly what you did and what you've done and such and then so that you can also look back on it yourself like your farmer notes are going to be probably your biggest asset as you're farming <clears throat> and of will course, the, it's mm -hmm. will the sun uh, play a factor in browning, like if it was in too much di direct sunlight or? Well, typically the cauliflower plant, and I know the variety that we give out is called self blanching. So it, you know, cauliflower covers itself mm -hmm. from the sun. And, you know, that browning, you know, is that just surface browning or is that that plant, you know, coming past, meaning that it was ready for harvest, but it wasn't ready for har it wasn't harvested on time. You know, just left in there. And if you cut open that browning, you know, how deep is that browning? Is it an insect that's on the inside or such? And now this is just plant diagnosis, which is a super fun, um, you know, thing to uh, figure out. <laughs> yeah. We will have a harvesting portion coming up in a bit to talk about those. But <clears throat> generally when trying to figure out you know, what happened to your plant, there are so many numerous things that can happen with farming. I mean, watering, watering is a huge portion, which could probably be the uh, thing here, but also insects, nutrient availability, weather, fluctuations and all of that. So all these things we're, uh, you know, trying to mitigate control as farmers and growers. So quite a bit of stuff. Well, let's see. Oh, great. Uh, so yeah. there's no Sorry. more questions. Oh, no, you're fine. If there's no more questions about this, we're going to move on. And he will address uh, harvesting. So I see the question here about harvesting the cauliflower. So we'll address that in a moment, OK? All right. All right. OK. Mm. 
Now, let's get into this. I'm going to utilize our PowerPoint from last year with our harvesting plant. We got about so many different um, vegetables featured this year. So I'm gonna pull this up for us real quick. And let's see what the, yes, okay. Wrong sheet, sorry everybody. All right, let's get into some, talk about our harvest. Okay, <clears throat> now I'm going to try and um, quickly go over it. And there are some specific uh, harvest um, crops, harvesting crops that we want to talk about. Please drop those in the chat and search, but I'll generally, Go down the line here, uh, and I'll also go to that specific um, slide for that plant too. But what we first want to know about our plants is whether or not these are multi-harvest crops or single harvest crops. Single harvest meaning that if we plant one seed, we are getting one plant, and of course there are you know different portions of that plant that could be use separately or incorporated as well. For example, like a beet plant. We all know that root portion of the beet that we eat, but those leaves are also edible as well. So that's just an example of a root crop, or excuse me, a single harvest crop. And I'll also add some other uses as well. And I'll also add that, you know, you can also, harvest those beet greens when they're little seedlings, like a micro crane, you can harvest them at that portion too. So very multi-harvest crop. Um, a lot of these crops that we're giving out in cold crops are, can be used as micro greens too, but I don't recommend that with the amount of seed that we give gave people, but that's just something good to know. A example of a multi-harvest crop is something like our collards. So collards, that's a big beefy, well, beefy, huh? big plant that has multiple leaves that shoot off. So once it becomes mature, then we're able to you know, harvest off a couple leaves at a time. And then after about a week or so, you'll be ready to harvest that plant again. And so that's an example of a multi-harvest crop versus a single harvest crop. Now you'll imagine, um, from a single harvest crop, if you got 12 seeds, that means that you got you know, 12 of that single harvest crop from a multi-harvest crop, you know, you're getting multiple harvests from that plant. But then at that point, you should be thinking about how long it takes for that multi-harvest crop to recover from a harvest. And so when we are planting things like your multi-harvest crops, your collards, your kales, your dino kales, and even getting into hot crop, you know, your peppers, your tomatoes, and even some of our um, direct soil crops like your all greens mix, your lettuce mix, you know, those are multi-harvest crops. You know, how long does it take for those to recover? And, you know, how do you best plan out that planting so that you can ideally have those crops available to you for harvest, you know, each week? Now, you can open my wine, huh? You can open that wine. And so, when we have, let's just say, take our college, for example, we waited for those to mature all the way. And now they're ready for harvest. But we want to make sure that we, you know, have some harvest for next week. So, once, what's one thing that you can do? Let's say you got just starting on the small scale here, you got two collards. You got one collard planted here, another collard planted right next to it. And at a time, 
I'd say generally when you're first starting from a harvest with the plant that you only just take maybe just a couple leaves off it. Don't do a hard harvest. Hard harvest is where you take, you know, depending on the amount of leaves that are on the plant, a light harvest is maybe three to four leaves, hard harvest, five to seven leaves. And you know, that can generally change um, depending on your plant. But as a general note, we'll just call that hard harvest and soft harvest. Now start off by lightly harvesting your multi-harvest crops when they're first getting going. You know, they're still utilizing those leaves for photosynthesis and collecting energy and such. And it's all also good to, to, you know, give your plants some time before you really start to harvest them. So wait for those maturity days to pass, or, you know, you can just let nature tell you when that plant is ready for harvest, when you're <laughs> looking at it and you're like, I'm hungry. Oh, there you go. But so when you first start to harvest your plant, just start off with light harvest and just harvest from that one plant that first week. Let that other plant, you know, do its thing for that first week. Just let it continue to grow. And then once that next week comes, you're gonna harvest from that other plant. And then that other plant is resting. Then you have your, and then you just continue on with that cycle of giving one plant some rest and then harvesting from the other plant the next week. And so by there, you are you know, letting your plant recover and rejuvenate from that past harvest. And you're continuously able to have lots of harvest from your plants and such. Now that's how you pretty much have a succession harvest from your multi-harvest crops. And imagine that on a larger scale, you got one row, maybe a 50 foot row or however long, of your collards, you harvest from that one row one week, and then you harvest from the other row the next week. And that's how farms stay on top of, you know, how they're able to have produce ready, at least from those monthly harvest crops, ready consistently. And let's say if you got like a, a really big harvest that you're expecting or that you need a really big harvest for a dinner or something, you know, give your plants a break like maybe give them about a two week break before you have to harvest all that produce for them to really get beefed up and whatnot. And then you can just have a big harvest and then have all that produce ready for your event or your dinner, and so on. So those are some easy ways to um, have a succession harvest with your plants and have them available when you need them available. And then of course that also involves some timing too. So say for example, the crops that we gave out your collards, let's just say, for example, those are going to take about maybe a month and a half for them to reach that maturity level. You know, when you're planning and timing out when you're going to want this crop available, you know, work based off of those maturity days to just give you a, an idea. And when they do give those maturity days, you know, that's not the law. That's not, you know, how it's actually going to look at your arm because those are just know, estimations and such. So your plant might be readier sooner than that. It might be ready later than that. It really at all just comes down to conditions. It's not a matter of time. It's a matter of conditions for your plants and what you give your plants. Now, shifting over to single harvest crops. You know, that's one seed, one harvest, basically. And so when you are trying to make sure that you get a consistent harvest from those plants, what you need to do then is instead of harvesting every other week with those ones, what you're going to be doing with those plants are seeding every other week. Or basically seeding every other week, yeah. So that means in week one, I'm going to seed some beets and carrots. Then week two, I'm going to seed some beets and carrots again. Week three, doing the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. So that while those seeds are planted, that first week one, carrots, those take about maybe almost three months to be ready for harvest. After three months, those first carrots are ready. You eat those carrots, you use them, you sell them. How are you going to use them? And then you can come the next week and harvest those week two carrots. And so that's how you have to think about your succession plantings with those two different types of crops and such. Now we can, once we have that knowledge, now we can go into individually 
harvesting our plants and the uh, different nuances now. Go through and talk about the ones that I think are uh, a little bit uh, yeah, less known. All right, so I just have to find these ones. <clears throat> so this is just some of our leafy greens. So, um, pardon me, our, our all greens mix, that's a multi harvest crop. Our, spinach, our arugula, our mustard greens, our lettuce mix, and our Swiss chard. These are all seeds that you all get from us. Those are all multi-harvest crops. The important thing to know, specifically for the all greens mix, the arugula, the mustard greens, they, when they're in the ground, they have a something that's called a growing point. And so these are pretty much cut greens that you cut off with other scissors or knives. And what we wanna make sure when we come in and harvest those is that we don't cut the growing point where the point where all the leaves and such shoot off from the plant, we don't wanna cut below that. We wanna cut just a little bit above that so that that plant can continue to grow. That's the most important thing to know about those crops. Swiss chard, Swiss chard is very similar to collards and kale where that you wanna give it a growing period to let it get completely uh, more developed before you start to harvest off that crop and then you can harvest it as you like or harvest it in periods that you like. Your turnips, turnips, you're, that's a single harvest crop. And what you're gonna be looking out for is pretty much just the size of that turnip head. And typically, Depending on the type of turnip, if it's a uh, salad turnip, which is more so used for its small um, root ball and of course it's leafy greens, we're gonna go for a golf sized ball head on that turnip. If you let that salad turnip get any bigger, then it's gonna become past from that point, past meaning that it's past its peak and it's more so on the decline where the plant is putting more energy into its greens and seed production and so on and such. And even with um, things like radishes, uh, I consider radishes and turnips family. Um, <clears throat> with radishes, if you let those go past and how you check to see if they're ready, radishes, you wanna just squeeze them just a little bit when they're firm and you know the desired size. As long as they're firm, you know, they're ready for harvest and at that size that you want. But if you squeeze them and they're kind of squishy, that means that uh, you probably should have harvested that radish maybe a couple of days ago. If it's squishy, that means that that radish is hollow. And that can sometimes happen to turnips as well. But radishes like your French breakfast radishes or your Davignon radishes, they get hollow in the middle and squishy when they're past their peak. And so those cut greens, make sure that you're cutting above that growing point so that they can regrow. If you cut below that growing point and you've just uh, had a single harvest, you just turned that multi-harvest crop into a single harvest crop. Your Swiss chard, give it some time, just like your collar can kill. Get it nice and beefy before you harvest. And your turnips, you're only gonna look for those golf ball sized turnips from those. All right, let's see. So beets and carrots, <clears throat> beets and carrots, you're basically just gonna wait for those plants to develop into the ideal size. And it's gonna take some time for those, probably about three or so months for those particular crops to get ready. The beets, those are going to be pretty easy to see because you can just sometimes they show out of the ground when they're ready and you can kind of see their size. Carrots, those ones you, you can just uh, brush off the side of the soil on that plant or you can even look at the um, the length of its um, carrot top and so once that length becomes really bushy or so and really tall then you can kind of guesstimate what's the size of your plant 
or what's the size of that root system for your harvest. And another thing that I like to do is also just brush off the top and look at the green, the orange part of it and see, guesstimate based on the circumference of that, how it looks. And depending on the amount of carrots and beets that you have, well, specifically with carrots, because there's more underneath the eye that you can't really see. It's kind of an iceberg. You can just take one carrot, pull it out, and if that carrot is, you know, you know, completely harvest that one carrot, and then just look at it, and you can kind of guesstimate the how what the um, how the other carrots look off that other one, and then if you're happy with that, you can um, you know use it from there. Um, carrots, if they are past their harvest stage. Science to tell that if, if the root system becomes a little bit more woody, so like you bite into that carrot or such, it's more woody, it starts to, you can see roots, like larger root systems really start to protrude from that carrot plant and so on. And so that's a simple sign there for that plant. And then I wanna back up a little bit and go back to the, um, lettuce mix and such. Typically with the lettuce mix, the y'all greens mix and all of that, you can get about two to three cuts from those plants. All right, let's see. The cilantro, very simple. Once those leaves are developed, those leaves are ready for harvest. You just wanna give those time before you start to harvest them and cut from them. They will bolt during the summer, so you wanna try and keep them in a shaded area if you have that out in your garden or keep them well watered so that they're not stressed. Snap peas, my a favorite. What you wanna look for is the pods that are developing and you wanna kind of harvest your pods before they become, um, what's the word, kind of ribbed. So you wanna harvest them when they're smooth and still kind of firm and such. And one thing that you can also do with like any of your foods and such, when you are questioning whether or not they're ready for harvest or not, just take a bite of them and see and figure it out. Um, your taste buds, your tongue, your body will tell you, oh, that's a, that's a good experience there. Or try your foods at different periods in their life to just kind of see for yourself, you know, when that crop is ready. Um, taste is king. All right. And I will kind of speed through these a little bit more since uh, we're running out of time a little bit. I want to save some time for some questions. After this, um, broccoli, I'll go through the ones that are kind of a little bit less unknown here. The broccoli, once that head starts to develop, you want to make sure that it's still tight and you want to be looking at the the top of that broccoli plant. So that's where the seeds start to protrude out. If you see discoloration and kind of flower head starting to opening up on that crown of that plant, that means that it's starting to become past and that you should harvest that off. And broccoli is kind of a more difficult plant to kind of figure out when it's ready for harvest, but Generally speaking, you wanna make sure that it's of size that you like and that it still has its color consistency before it starts to kind of break color and such. And same thing with broccoli, if you're not too sure about when to harvest that plant, you know, just cut it off. There will be more that will shoot from the sides. I believe the variety that we chose for you all is a multi-harvest crop for this round. And then the fall crop that we got for you is more so a really big head crop variety that still has some side shoots, but more so um, selected for genetically for its um, huge head. For Brussels sprouts, those are just gonna grow all the way through September and such. And then once the side shoots really start to develop, what you wanna do is prune that leader head. So imagine it's like a broccoli plant. You wanna cut off that tip of that broccoli plant. And with it, what that's gonna do is start those side shoots to develop on the Brussels sprouts. And then 
Ooh, Brussels sprouts can get really, can get really weedy. Let's see, just a little bit. Those Brussels sprouts can get really uh, infested with insects and such. So make sure that you keep those covered throughout the entire season. I've seen some um, aphids within the Brussels sprouts that we harvest off. So keep those covered throughout the season and keep them um, sprayed as well if you have that capacity. Um, celery, that's a pretty straightforward one. You just wanna let that celery grow out. If you are gonna blanch your celery, um, what you do in that part is basically cover it up from the sun, um, make sure that it has some wrapping around it, whether that's cardboard or such, that's gonna help you get that celery that you kind of know and see at the store. You don't really have to do that. You can either just let that celery grow with the sunlight. It's a little bit more, um, not as watery, but it has a lot more flavor and it is a bit more, um, I guess in terms of texture, a little bit more harder to chew through. And one thing that they do with that process with the celery that you normally see at the store, they, they blanch it, meaning that they cover it up from sunlight, and then they just water it super heavily, make sure that it's getting as much water as possible. And that's one of the unique things with celery. Bok choy, when that's growing up, you just want to kind of grab that head, same with cabbage. You want to grab that head and move it around just a little bit. And if it's sturdy, that means that it's ready for harvest. But if it's not sturdy, meaning that it just moves around quite easily, then it's not ready for harvest. All right, leeks. That's a fairly simple one. That crop is in the soil for a long time. So once it's of your desired size, then it's ready for harvest. Um, leeks are a very interesting crops. Plants within the allium family, so your onions, shallots, scallions, they're ready for harvest at any period. And, and every part of that plant is edible as well. And so it's really just up to the grower when they want that plant to eat. Uh, brassicas, we've gone over. Here's some more information and we'll also send over this PowerPoint as well so that you all can go through. Don't forget about the cauliflower. Yes, making it to those. Here we go, the cauliflower. All right, so for the cauliflower, it's very much similar to the broccoli. They're, I'd say they're cousins. Well, maybe these are all cousins, but you know, brothers and sisters, if you will. And so with the cauliflower, it's pretty much the same practice. If you see that the cauliflower is starting to peak from its leaf wrapping and so on. That's a sign that your cauliflower is ready to harvest. What you want to make sure that you do when you do harvest your cauliflower is that you try to keep those leaves that are wrapped around it intact. So when you come through and cut your plant, you still have those leaves intact on your plant. Oops. <clears throat> And so, because those are gonna act as a natural kind of packaging for that plant, if you will. And so when you harvest your plant, don't, don't rip off those leaves, keep those intact with your cauliflower. And it's very much similar to the broccoli. If you see some protruding that's happening from that leaf, um, harvest those ones out. And cauliflower is a new plant as well. So I recommend that you, you know, give it a try at different stages. What do you feel like it's like, okay, this kind of looks like a cauliflower that I see at the grocery store. And actually the cauliflower that you see at the grocery store has its leaves ripped off because naturally the leaves are covering that plant. But if it's of that size that you're typically used to seeing, I'd say, you know, give it a shot at harvesting that plant at different sizes to see and such. But, all right, sorry that I had to kind of speed through a lot of the harvest portions, but you know, this sheet is from, this PowerPoint is from last year, so it has a lot more information on lettuces and bolting and such. 
and also some other practices too. But it's uh, really good. Maybe some of the uh, plots that we don't have here and so on. So um, I'm open to going over a little bit if people still have questions. But yeah. And we will have a strawberry distribution this year that will be happening with our sweet potatoes. And I believe that class is taking place at somewhere around the end of May, beginning of June. So look forward to that one for picking up some transplants, some strawberry seedlings and sweet potatoes. Any questions about harvesting and multi-harvest crops, single harvest crops and such? All right, any more questions before we end the class this evening? I did leave my email and Akello's email in the chat if you wanna copy that down and you can send questions to us as well. If, you know, if we missed anything or if you are in a garden this weekend planting your cold crops and you forget something, just shoot us an email. We're always available to help you out. We would like to thank you for joining us this evening and we hope to see you at some other classes. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. All right, have a good night. All right, peace. See you too. All right, All right. thank you. Have a good night. All right, good night.